Ladies and gentlemen, this is Candy Black. I'm going to be reviewing a couple of housekeeping details before we get started today. Uh, we have about 100 uh, pre-registered attendees currently online and more adding as I speak. So we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve use of the chat for questions for the presenters or for when the presenters specifically instruct participants to use that feature. If you get accidentally disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I'll assist you. My cell phone number is on the confirmation email that I've sent you previously. Bill Heller has been entering into the chat the link to the handouts folder for this webinar. In the folder following the webinar, you will find a PDF of the presentation. It will not be in there during the presentation, but will be added immediately afterwards. Within about 24 hours of this event, those who attend the webinar in full will receive either a certificate of attendance or a CTLE certificate. The type you'll be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. As you heard, this webinar is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event so that those who are unable to attend live or those who wish to see it again can do so and earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post assessment correctly. This is our next workshop in the 2023 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I am your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. The webinar description is as follows. The World Languages team at East Aronaquite Middle School will share our exploration of the revised New York State World Language Standards over the past three years. Participants will learn how through collaboration and even some failure, we developed new unit plans, adjusted assessments, implemented new instructional strategies, and created a culture of proficiency in our language classrooms. We will share our successes and challenges and give you some examples of how you can make the shift in your school. I would like now to invite our workshop presenters, Zoe Baird and Joshua Weigel-Harris to begin this workshop. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Josh Weigel Harris. Um, and as Candy said, uh, I work at East Rondequay Middle School with my colleague and co-presenter Zoe Baird. Um, we want to just do continue with a couple of little housekeeping things as well. Um, we, we wanted to make you aware of some upcoming uh, learning opportunities. So um, there's a, a big election day workshop happening on November 7th. Um, that is something that you can uh, sign up for at the uh, website. Um, you can go there and find all the information about registration. Um, also, creating assessments for Checkpoint A. Um, that's tentatively scheduled for November 14th. And then target language use at Checkpoint A as well, which is happening on Tuesday, December 5th. Again, all of the information um, will be found on the website, and um, you can find recordings of all of them after the, the webinars are uh, happen as well, and you can take a, an exam for credit um, afterwards if you can't make it to the live sessions. Throughout our presentation today, you will see several symbols. The red microphone with the line through it is cueing you to please mute your microphone during that portion. The blue thought bubble will prompt you to think alone about what we are talking about at that point. The green text bubble is us asking you to write a message in the chat if you have something to share on that topic. And last but not least, the little yellow folder in the corner will indicate that that document will be available in the Google folder during our presentation and you can pull that up at that time. So by the end of today's session, our goals are that you will be able to say that you can identify actionable steps to develop a unit aligned with the revised standards. I can understand how assessments and rubrics support instruction based on the revised, revised standards. And I can identify strategies to promote student agency and a classroom environment of proficiency. Just to get started, here are some disclaimers that we have to share with you. We are in no way a language proficiency experts, nor will we claim to be. We are very much learning along this journey. We are not perfectionists, and we have made many mistakes along this path. 
but that's how we've learned from one another. We have been working on the shifts that we are going to show today over the course of the last three years. So by no means was this done overnight and we are still actively working on many changes day to day. Throughout our department in the last three years, we have had a lot of changes. We have had department members leave. We have had new ones come. We have had teachers within our department switch the language that they were teaching. So there have been a lot of changes throughout this time as well. And with that, we don't always agree on everything at first, but talking through everything with one another, getting one another's insight and perspective has been very eye-opening and has been a crucial part of this process. We do have dedicated professional learning community time once uh, every four days within our building that allows us to do a lot of work together and make a lot of these curriculum changes. And last but not least, we uh, are working at the middle school level. So we have our primary focus on the novice level, checkpoint A. So we wanted to break down for you a little bit about um, our timeline. So um, you can see that uh, our our timeline starts back in what we like to call the dark days. Um, so back in 2020, um, we started to hear rumblings about uh, this change and started the information started coming out. And so we decided um, that we were going to, uh, you know, jump on it. Um, also around that time or not, not soon uh, before that, um, my whole department either retired or moved on to other things. And so it was just me. So I said, why not? Let's do this. So, um, just to give you an idea of, of kind of where we where our starting point was, um, we started to decide to do one unit per quarter. Um, that was a big change for us from just kind of units of different uh, lengths and um, just kind of rolling through those one by one. We decided to spend one unit per uh, per quarter and to kind of dive deeper into um, whatever it was that we were studying in that quarter. We started to really look at our formative versus summative assessments. Um, we also uh, did some curriculum work. You'll notice that um, you know curriculum work is a thing that we did for probably about three or four summers um, to help get this um, accomplished. Um, we also look, worked on culturally embedded lessons or units. So we decided that with the, the spreading out of our material and our curriculum, we were also going to connect each of those units to a target culture and a target country, and then talk about various things that occur in that place and within that culture. Um, in 2021 to 2022, um, we Zoe and I both participated in the Checkpoint A um, curric or unit plan writing. And um, that was really helpful for us because we, we were able to kind of deepen our understanding of what, what was what kind of ways in which we can um, adjust our units and really start to weave in the, the revised, revised standards. Um, we also reestablished some roles within our department, as was previously stated, reformatted assessments again. At that time, our school district um, and in our middle school in particular was working on a school-wide grading commitments uh, document, which involved us not giving any grades lower than a 50, our grades are are based on assessments only, and they also stressed and expected that all students were um, reattempting assessments to try to show some progress in their learning, um, which really helped again in the shift um, that we made within our department. And then from about 2022 to current times, um, we're really looking at revising our our units to be more thematic. Um, connecting our the the modes of communication together more within our units, um, contextualizing our lessons and less and lessons and assessments more. Um, we've done a lot of work over the past couple of years on rubrics, and as the rubrics have been um, released as well, that's helped us to kind of shift our thinking. Um, and then this year, it's important to note as well, we went to an outcomes based grading system essentially a standards-based grading system uh, school-wide at our middle school. 
which aligns very well with some of the things that we'll show you later on with rubrics and um, some of the other things that we've um, shifted in our in instruction and in our planning. So here is a comprehensive list of the shifts highlighted in the timeline Josh just reviewed. The resources provided by New York State have served as a foundation for all of our curriculum work and the shifts that we're going to discuss today. The use of proficiency language has had a profound impact on our instruction, but also on students' understanding of their language learning journey. It has encouraged them to self-assess, set goals that they can tr clearly track within our three-year middle school program, which we have found to be super beneficial for them. On the topic of authentic resources, using resources made by speakers of the language for speakers of the language has been a shift that has increased inquiry among our students, as well as helped us tighten the cultural focus for each of the thematic units. Looping through the communication modes, when we use an authentic resource for multiple communicative tasks and throughout multiple communication modes, it has been an effective shift to push students to take a deeper dive within the text. And we will show an example of this later on. Thanks to our dedicated PLC time, that professional learning community time that we have once every four days during the school year, and as Josh mentioned, the extensive curriculum writing that we have done over the last two summers, you can tell that we placed a lot of value in our collaborative planning, all the way from planning the unit from an overview down to our day-to-day -day plans. Additionally, while planning as a department, a huge priority of ours has been how can we create a thematic unit students are interested in that is also accessible for all of the learners within our classroom. So hopefully we can convince you that we have done that by the end of our session today. <laughs> So we've decided to do a little bit of before and now. Um, so kind of what things might have looked like. So if you've been around for a while, you might recognize that, you know, some of these things I talk about, I've, this is your 18 for me. So I've been around for a little while. Um, and I've also, uh, you know, I took language classes myself back in school. So we're going to kind of compare that to now. And it's perfect because Zoe is, you know, in year three of, of being a teacher. So we're really kind of kind of show you the before and the now. So before instructionally, we were we were really working with predetermined lists of vocabulary. We were really focused on memorization of that vocabulary and just kind of piling in as much of, of that vocabulary as possible. Now we go straight to the source and we ask our students, what words, what language structures would you use or want to know about this thematic topic? And we also add vocabulary that's relevant to the target culture, as well as any vocabulary that's essential for communication purposes in that unit. I wanna point out in this, in this uh, comparison as well, you'll notice that in both of them, it says lists, vocab lists, right? So, um, you know, when you're looking at this shift and you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's so scary. I can't let go of all these things that I'm used to. Um, we haven't let go of vocabulary lists in the sense that they're there as a resource for the students, right? We don't expect them to go through and, and pronounce everything together as a class or anything like that, but it's a resource for them. It's, a, it's something that they know that they can go to that has the structures that they need to be able to communicate in the language and do the activities and the tasks that we're doing in class. So we also used to have very topic-based units. And if you've taken any of these webinars or done any sort of research, you'll know that, you know, before we used to do a food unit, we used to do a house unit, we used to do a family unit. And all of those things were separate and they were based on topics. And so now we've kind of made a shift to now we take a much deeper dive into several integrated topics under one theme that takes place in a target country and that target culture over the course of 10 weeks. 
we also, um, you know, I don't, I know that back in the day I was creating and creating and creating so many resources myself, just out of my head, coming up with different narratives or, or paragraphs or different types of reading. Can you watch the video? Yeah. Right now, with the use of authentic resources, students are exposed to what the speakers of the language really say, the language structures and vocabulary that they use, whether it be text or audio, it truly opens a door for students to learn from speakers in that target culture. And powerful moments happen when students can make those cultural ties and connections between themselves and the target culture. And then also, maybe sometimes we covered some content. Maybe we taught them a vocab word or a structure. And then it wasn't revisited again. And then we said, hey, remember that word you learned all the way back at the beginning of seventh grade? Well, now you have to remember that again for your test that you're taking at the end of eighth grade. Where now we have modified our curriculum very purposefully. So everything is sequential. Phrases, vocabulary, language structures, they are used consistently throughout our sixth through eighth grade program which increases student confidence and their ability to use those structures and vocabulary in new contexts, as well as using a resource through a multiple communication modes, which we will show you later on. This is very easy to do once we have those integrated topics under one thematic unit, because like we said, vocab and phrases, they're brought back and reviewed from unit to unit, year to year. And when you're mindful of this and this becomes a part of your practice, then you get to have the really nerdy teacher moments where you're like, oh my God, you're using that structure that you used way back in sixth grade and you learned it in this unit and, and now you're using it again and then you're gonna use it again in the future. So um, it, it's something that we've really been very intentional about. So maybe also there was a large large quantity of content, content in short periods of time. So each of those units that we're doing, you know, all 11 of them in one year, um, also had a ton of vocabulary in each unit that we expected students to, to memorize. Our main goal is to create a toolkit for communication. So that's going to consist of small digestible chunks and language structures that students can use over and over again, unit to unit, year to year. Which is something that's sometimes hard to let go of when we know as teachers we really like a certain we want we think kids need to know a certain structure or they need to know this vocabulary for a test or something like that but when you start to think about it as a way for them to communicate and things that they actually would want to be able to say or need to say it actually has a lot more power than you know maybe a, a vocabulary structure or word that we just as teachers can't let go of so also students used to receive a number grade um you know a percentage grade and that was their, you know, their gauge of their progress and their success. So rather than attaching their performance to a numerical value, the use of proficiency language to describe their language level and performance has a very clearly defined meaning. So that way students can understand where they are and where they should strive to be. It also helps predetermine a goal for them within their, relative to their language abilities within our program. So instead of trying to get a 100, they can strive to be at a novice high. So their feedback, reflection, performance, that is all given to them in terms of proficiency language within our classrooms. So speaking of that proficiency language in the classroom environment, we wanted to just talk about a shift, you know, some shifts that we have made in that realm as well. So. Um, in the past, maybe students have been more likely or have been more able to play a passive role um, in, in their language class. Um, you know, they could maybe fade into the background or maybe they were really great on paper. And so that that was that was all that they needed to do. Um, and the speaking portion of the class wasn't as important because they could make up for it on paper. But now our daily classwork consists of interactive activities and tasks where students are either directly interacting with one another or ourselves. So regardless, there's an accountability piece which creates participation 
And hopefully they're also being intrinsically motivated due to our thematic units being of high interest to them. Um, at times, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody re remembers this or experienced this in school, but I, um, I remember sometimes there being a really high risk of um, maybe I'd make a mistake and the teacher was going to correct me. And I always had to, you know, really focus on accuracy rather than communication. And so it created kind of an intimidating environment um, for myself as a language learner growing up at times. And um, I know I've done it to my students before in the past. Um, you know, full disclosure, I'm not perfect, right? But like we said, our main goal is communication with an emphasis on acceptance and comfort with making mistakes. And we model that for them. We tell them that that's okay because that's how you're going to learn. And we do that through providing a low risk, safe environment for them to do so. Um, maybe we were focused on task completion too. Um, you know, I know we've had students in the past who are just like, how do I get this done? How do I get the grade? Um, you know, how do I, you know, do the things that you're asking me to do just so I can get a 100 and be done? And we're not saying that students don't care about grades at all now, but they do take a lot of pride in self-identifying their proficiency level. And rather than aiming to get a, a numerical value grade, now they often focus on how they can improve their performance. And we use the term leveling up with them. And they're always asking, how can I level up and get to novice high? Or how can I get to intermediate low? And that's really easy to tell them because those proficiency levels are very clearly defined. And we have them posted in our rooms as well to reference daily in class. Also, I'd, I'd add in here that it's also really easy to give a kid quick feedback in this type of environment too, a proficiency language, because if you're noticing that they have written something or they've said something that is not at the level that you think they can be at, all you have to do is kind of say to them, what level, what level do you think that that response mm -hmm. is? Or what do you think you'd earn if you, by saying that phrase? And then they kind of know what you mean by that, right? You don't have to point anything out specifically at that point. They have that opportunity to kind of reflect and, and self-correct a little bit to hopefully reach their, their desired target level. Um, we all know that, you know, in the past, we've focused on listening, reading, speaking, writing. Those were the areas we, we skill areas that we were focused on. Or now we've, talk about, and we use the language of the three modes with students. And we've said the word looping through the modes as well, because we really strive to draw connections between the communicative modes for students, uh, providing input with them through interpretive reading and listening to then asking them to produce some sort of output through presentational speaking or writing as well as interpersonal speaking. And all of these things, as well as proficiency language, we explicitly go over with students at the beginning of the year. So that way we can use this language with them. And we do every single day in class through our tasks and activities. Just today, uh, we were getting ready to do a presentational task. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, explained presentation, prepared, practice, present the information. It's an outward presentation of information versus that interpersonal where it's spontaneous, they're talking to each other and it's a back and forth where you have to listen and respond. So have explaining that to students really I think helps make sure that they know what's expected of them as they're doing the task of the day or when you get to the time of assessment. So here's a snapshot of our thematic units and their cultural ties for our sixth through eighth program. Um, today, we are going to specifically focus and provide an example of our work through the lens of our eighth grade unit, The Perfect Gift, which takes place in Spain. And we have to give Bill Haller a huge shout out for this. This unit was inspired by him, as well as you'll see our Places of Importance unit that takes place in Peru. That was also inspired by Dr. Joanne O'Toole. And you can see in our sixth grade program, as well as several of our other thematic units, their work in progress. So like we said, we are not perfect. We are still very much developing this. Um, but today 
we will be showing you our work and some of these shifts through the lens of the perfect gift unit. So here's a screenshot of the perfect gift unit context. And if you're not familiar with this template, this is the New York State unit template that Josh mentioned before. Um, and we shifted to this template after we participated in that unit plan checkpoint A workshop. So highlighted here are the integrated topics. So as we said, our unit title is the perfect gift with the anchor topic being shopping. So in the past, this unit would have previously been known as the shopping unit. Now it's the perfect gift and we will cover a wide variety of topics such as family and social relationships, celebrations, customs and traditions, communities and neighborhood and identity. And the identity thing might seem a little bit weird, right? Like why is identity here with shopping? Um, and you'll kind of see later on what, how that um, how that filters in. Actually, Zoe's going to talk about that a little bit next. Here is the unit overview. So like we said, everything is sequential. We're providing a lot of input in the beginning and then asking them to produce output at the end. So starting out at the beginning of this unit, we asked students to identify places to buy gifts, whether that be physical places or online. This is referencing back to our communities and neighborhoods unit. The next portion of this unit is students identifying gifts that they would like to buy and receive. And this is where the chunk of new vocabulary is really coming in that we had students identify, what would you like to buy? What are things you actually buy? Um, and a lot of that we realized is review of food because they're very food oriented. <laughs> um, the next portion is identifying reasons to buy gifts. And this also reviews the celebrations, customs, and traditions topic. Following that is asking students to compare prices and descriptions of gifts, as well as describing characteristics of gifts and gift recipients. And that is where you are seeing some of the family and social relationships topic, as well as the identity topic, in order for students to connect a gift to a person and what they're like to make that connection of why that gift to be good for a said person. <clears throat> so. Oops, sorry, did I go too No, far? you're fine. <laughs> I was just going to say students get very invested in this unit because it has structures that are student-based and it's very, of very high interest to them, as well as the vocabulary, as we said, is coming directly from them. All right. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about assessment. Um, at, you know, assessment is an ever-growing, um, ever-changing topic on our agenda. Um, but I do want to just kind of point out in general, we, we use that New York State unit plan template. And part of that does lend itself to a little bit of backward design where you're you're looking at the different assessments, the ways you want students to show their knowledge. And then from there, you kind of build out, um, you know, what you, what kinds of tasks you want them to do to, leading up to that. Um, one huge thing, Zoe's already said it, but I'll stress it again. We let our students know that literally every task that we do is leading up to the next thing. So every, every single um, activity they do, every single thing that they are learning and applying is then brought back into something else later on. Um, assessment. Uh, we do in the different modes. So we'll have roughly about four assessments per quarter. Um, they will be based on the interpretive mode. So there'll be a listening and a reading. And then you also have uh, some sort of presentation that will happen. And then we are very intentional about having a speaking, um, interpersonal speaking assessment um, in each quarter. And we'll show you how we do that um, as we go through talking about assessment. Um, we have proficiency-based rubrics. So um, we have those now for all of the different modes. We do something called flex days. Um, so we'll we'll talk to you about that a little bit, but it's basically a time where we take a pause and do makeups, reattempts, and also provide some extension for students. We have our school grading commitments, which really drive a lot of what our assessments um, look like and how they're graded. And then also, 
we've been really trying to be intentional about leveling questions based on the targets for each grade level. Um, so in, in general, by the end of sixth grade, we're looking for a novice low to mid, end of seventh grade, novice mid, and then by the end of eighth grade, novice high. So a little comparison of maybe before and now when it comes to assessment. Um, before, I know when I started teaching, I gave unit tests that had reading, listening, writing, maybe a mock speaking sort of uh, section to it. Um, and all of those were given all at the same time. Now, um, we're really assessing by mode um, and then also the skills that are that are kind of related to that. So um, as I said earlier, uh, we break it down by the modes and then, you know, the reading and listening is sort of broken down within that. Um, the presentational writing and speaking is also broken down within that um, mode. Um, a lot of times assessments were one and done. So you took it once, you got your grade, and then you moved on. And you apparently that 82 was supposed to tell you everything you needed to know about your ability to communicate and, and your knowledge of shopping. Now we're really looking to um, have materials um, or sorry, have the material and the skills that we are, are working on with the students assess multiple times. Um, so we're really working on being intentional about that practice leading up and then also the assessments themselves. And the feedback that you, they get from that is a lot more detailed and gives them a better idea of where they're at with their proficiency level. Before we were maybe worried about quantity. So maybe um, I remember, I don't know, probably the first seven years of my teaching, we were giving a quiz about every week or week and a half. And we were just like rocking through quiz after quiz after quiz after quiz. And then we give a unit test. Um, now we're really looking at quality. So um, that assessment that the students take, there's a lot leading up to it. And then we're looking at them being able to show some growth. So if they're not successful for the first time on that test, they're reattempting, they're showing some growth, and they're really um, hopefully reaching that target by the end of the, the reattempt process. Maybe we had multiple choice, fill in the blanks, lists, translations. Now we're looking at a lot of um, short answer responses. We're looking at some explanations. So when we, we dive into the interpretive work a little bit more, we're really looking for students to explain their understanding of what they're reading in the target language through the use of their English language um, and kind of backing up um, what they're telling us their answer is with evidence from whatever they listened to or whatever they read. This speaking in the past, maybe there was not a lot done for assessment. Maybe there was a cold call. Maybe we were listening in on conversations or doing skits. Now we're doing intentional activities and assessments in each unit for both interpersonal and presentational speaking. Um, if you don't think that eighth graders can do or seventh graders or even sixth graders can do presentational speaking, they can. Um, and, you know, we've, we've really been intentional so that by the time the students, you know, progress through our program, the, the presentations and the speaking that they do with those is, um, is not something that's scary and it's something that they feel comfortable with. Now, this is not to say that my eighth graders aren't scared about their presentational speaking assessment they're going to have in a couple of weeks, but we're doing some things uh, to get them ready for that and um, make it not so scary. We before maybe just had some rubrics for writing, maybe for speaking. Um, now we have some rubrics for all the modes that we um, that we do with the students. So this is um, your first kind of takeaway thing from today, and that is um, something called Flex Day. So Flex Day is a pause that is planned in the curriculum. So after we give an assessment, we will actually choose a date a few days after the assessment where we pause. We, we pause instruction. We don't introduce anything new necessarily. And we make all the students go back and look at their assessment do some reflection. And we want them to be looking specifically at the things that are expected of them at that checkpoint um, or at that level, sorry, proficiency level 
and with that specific communication mode that we're, we're assessing. And every student goes back and looks at their grade, indicates their grade on here. They answer some yes or no questions if they did not achieve that, that proficient score. By the way, just for, for some reference, the three is our target. The three is always our, our, our target for being on point. And then the four is always our stretch goal. Um, so, and that aligns also with our school grading uh, process where a three is um, proficient. It's also like they're, they're right on track. And then a four would be exceeds and going above and beyond the expectations. So with flex day, what happens is after the reflection, they really have two avenues. One, that they're going to reattempt their assessment. And so if they are going to reattempt their assessment, they go through a remediation sort of process where they're going to do some further learning. They're maybe going to do some extra practice that um, practices some of the skills that they need. Um, so for this assessment that we did, uh, this unit, um, by the way, this is for this unit, this what, what's on my plate unit that we're doing in eighth grade currently. Um, they either chose to brush up on their vocab or they could choose to look again at what our expectations were for their explanation of their understanding and um, use the rubric for interpretive work and um, kind of rate different levels of responses and, and different levels of understanding. Um, the other option that students have, if they're okay with their three or they got a four, is some sort of extension activity. And a lot of times that either has to do with whatever um, phase of the unit is coming next. And we kind of just boost them into that by watching a video or doing a little activity with some vocabulary. Um, or um, it could be some other activity that is based on cultural um, information and, and kind of deepening their understanding of that. So this flex day template is actually, will be in the folder for you to access and kind of modify and use um, if you'd like in the future, if that's a concept that you'd like to implement in your classroom. So here's an example of our interpretive listening assessment from the Perfect Gift Unit last year. So for this listening assessment, we were asking students to listen to recordings of people describing themselves. So reviewing the identity vocabulary, their characteristics, their interests, maybe their needs, and then match it to the most appropriate gift that you see down below using those images. And one thing that we really emphasize is taking notes while listening. Um, <clears throat> we've already discussed on how we will modify this assessment for this year, adding in that component where we will ask students to provide what we've been using the term, a demonstration of understanding. And we think that our emphasis on note-taking will really support them in their need to explain and draw those explicit connections between the audio and their answer. But some options of ways that you can ask students to demonstrate their understanding that we have used or will use what is, how do you know? What evidence do you have? What connections can you make to the text? Describe what you heard, so on and so forth. And those notes that they're taking while listening are really going to be essential in their explanations. Here is the interpretive reading assessment from last year. And what we really wanna highlight here was this interpretive reading assessment consisted of entirely authentic resources. You can see here, there's an advertisement from Carrefour, which is a store in Spain, our target culture for the perfect gift unit. And we have already discussed again how we will modify this for this year by adding that explanation component. But the questions that we already had for them last year really set them up for that level of deep analysis, asking them to explain why might someone go shopping at Carrefour. So they have to be able to look at the products in the advertisement and say, okay, why would someone want to go to this store? or asking them to compare two different authentic resources, as you can see in question number three, what do they have in common? So it's a really big shift from a word level understanding 
and to be able to truly interpret and analyze a text to determine meaning. And just for clarification here, just so you don't think, well, where's the Office Max thing? Um, <laughs> there, the, this, they would have been looking at advertisements and resources from multiple stores. We just tried to snip it down so that it was easier to read on the screen. So here is an example from our current unit of some of the changes that we've already made. So as you can see highlighted in just a moment, there are some questions that we've added this year that require deep analysis and understanding. So we asked them those questions of how did you know? Really asking them to explain their answers using evidence from the text. And this skill of being able to interpret or analyze a text is very much supported by our school at the school level because of our new standards or outcomes-based grading system. And one of the outcomes for our courses, sixth through eighth grade throughout the entire year, is the ability to interpret or analyze a text in the target language. So this interpretive rubric is what we're going to use to assess those interpretive reading and listening works as you just saw on the previous slide, those responses. So this rubric is a combination of the New York State rubric or our interpretation of it, as well as one that we used prior. And it's really important that to note, we are still modifying this as we go. This shift has taken a lot of time for us to grasp ourselves. And we found it really useful for the students' understanding to look at, as Josh said, we did one of these activities in the flux day remediation portion where they had to look at different demonstrations of understandings, different responses explaining their answers and assess them. So assign a proficiency level to them using this rubric to really help them understand what is expected of them based on their proficiency level. This is also something that has taken a lot of time for us to fully comprehend ourselves. And sometimes even explaining it a few times to students um, has helped us to, to deepen our understanding of what this really means because we haven't been used to using a rubric for listening or for reading. You know, it was give some multiple choice questions, you know, and now we're trying to look at it from um, a little bit more of a holistic um, uh, rubric based uh, lens. Um, we've we've got a phrase that we've we've started a coin which is sit and let it marinate. Um, we've had to sit with this rubric and just talk about it together and then say, okay, we can't talk about it anymore. <laughs> and you just let it marinate and like come back at another time and tell me what you think about it then. Um, so that, that's something that to keep in mind, you, you may have to do that along with the people in your department and look at something together and then just kind of let it go for a little bit and come back to it. So again, thinking about this, uh, this idea of the perfect gift, um, we then, uh, also did some interpersonal speaking. So for interpersonal speaking, uh, it's very important to know that we are really pushing students to interact with each other. And I know that may sound scary and it may seem unrealistic. Um, we all kind of like, even though we put it out there a few years ago and said, we're going to do this. We also thought that it was going to be, a, you know, go down in a big burning flame. Okay. But it actually didn't. And they actually shocked us to, with how well they did with this. So, we at first were doing some things where they were working with a partner and they were recording. Now what we do is we have a little conversation table. I'm actually in my classroom right now and over there in the corner is my conversation table where I will bring up groups of two or three and we will pick one of these situations to talk about and then they have the conversation. Now, I don't want to like make make it seem like I just sit back and I do nothing. Um, I am there as support for them. So if a student really gets stuck or I notice that a student isn't um, participating, I will actually, you know, do kind of hop into the conversation 
and suggest like something to get that that student connected to the conversation. The other thing that we do when we utilize, um, we're going to be actually doing an activity two days from now, is uh, an idea actually I got from Bill years ago at a nice felt conference, where I we use these little conversation cards that are prompts for the student that say, share your opinion, Ex you know, react to something someone said, ask a question. And so those are also prompts that kind of help students feel a little bit more confident. Um, and when you're talking about students that maybe really struggle as learners um, or they really struggle with knowing how to start, this is an opportunity for them to kind of have that scaffolding and that support it. No Spanish is involved. It's just English as like a little prompt to them to kind of make them think a little bit. So we've kind of cut this off, but you'll also notice that we have um, really worked on a interpersonal speaking rubric that gives the kids some feedback. But we also at the at the bottom have some individual feedback points that tie back to the, the different proficiency levels in the rubric and kind of help the students understand what you know what they did and how they did on the assessment so another little goodie that we're going to give you is this chat mat so um we got the idea of chat mats um a couple years ago from amy lenore um you know follow her on online she's she's great as far as production of resources um we kind of modified that created this template in powerpoint that we have made used to make several different chat mats for um, different units. What do we use the chat map for? The chat map is used for pre preparation leading up to speaking, and is also used for different conversational um, tasks that we have in class. You'll notice that the chat map is color coded. It's broken down by the way in which we think an eighth grade brain would think about different parts of the conversation. The thing I love about a chat map is I use the phrase all the time that it is puzzle pieces. It allows students to break down the different chunks of what they might say um, and then to be able to put them together in different ways. For our struggling students who are maybe not still at our, our, our level that we'd like to, our desired level at that moment in time, this provides them with things that are easily digestible and chunks that they can put together even if it's just a couple chunks, so that they can communicate a point. For our higher level learners, this offers them just a wide variety of ways to connect things together and to be able to kind of level up and um, increase their uh, ability to speak in the language. We also, if you'll notice on the second page of the chat map, often put in phrases para conectar or like connecting phrases, right? So. We're looking for students to move to that next level and show that they can, you know, um, change up their text type, can change up the way in which they construct their sentences. And by putting some of those phrases in there that um, that they can chunk stuff together with, it really is a, a great strategy. One of the things that we do um, to practice is something called a fishbowl. So you'll see here on this slide in the top left corner that this is like a little model in the in the square in the middle are all student speakers they're having a conversation they're doing that with their chat map they are talking to each other and just having conversation it's not graded they're just doing practice around the outside are observers and the observers are listening to the conversation they are taking note of what the people are saying and they're giving them some feedback they're giving feedback using some of these symbols here and these prompts here. Um, we're really, again, continuing this thought of proficiency language. You're making a statement um, or you responded to a question. You are including someone else in the conversation by agreeing or disagreeing. Maybe you're asking a question again. Um, if they know at this point, they know what leveling up means. They know what it means to kind of push yourself to that next proficiency level. And if they see someone doing that, they're going to give them a star. Afterwards, they debrief as a large group, give that feedback to the speakers, and then they switch and the speakers become the observers. And so, and you can figure that out from there.
So this is the final assessment that we're going to talk about today. And it was definitely Josh and I's favorite part of this unit, and the students had a lot of fun with it. So for their final assessment, they had to do a presentational speaking and writing assessment, which consisted of a PowerPoint presentation about the perfect gift for us, their teachers. So leading up to this assessment, we did a whole class interpersonal interview between the students and us as the teacher. The students prepared questions to ask us about our interests, our needs, our characteristics, bringing back the, the, the identity piece. And not only did they ask us those questions in the target language, but they also had to listen to one another and to their questions in order to record all of the information together and to create their presentation. So this truly was a multimodal activity because they had to speak, they had to listen and write all in the target language. So here we'll show you a little bit of an example of one of my students' presentations. So this student did so well that the gift that they bought me was something that I actually own. So this is, these pair of hiking boots are ones that I actually own, which he got a kick out of that afterwards. But you'll see here a few of the key language structures that we used and practiced throughout our unit. And this is a really good example of, we are not expecting perfection from them, right? This presentation is not perfect. You'll see typos in it. But he is very clearly communicating his intended message. And it's that once again, like our focus is on communication and it's understandable, it's comprehensible, and he completed all parts of the task. So we'll talk to you a little about a few tasks that we and, and how we've changed them over time to kind of um, come to the end of our presentation here. Um, before we were maybe talking about some teacher focused questions, teacher focused questioning, a lot of teacher based activities. For as we mentioned before in our changes in classroom environment, students play a very active role in our class every day. So rather than the teacher focused questioning, the students play a role as a questioner in this activity, the guessing game where students use this guide to form questions to try to determine what item us teachers are thinking of when there are a series of images projected on the board. Um, maybe some structured or scripted partner conversations were, it, it were in, uh, entailed in, the, um, in our instruction. Not saying there's anything that's, you know, that they don't have their place in time, but... As Josh showed in the fishbowl speaking strategy earlier, that's a great way that we support spontaneous conversations in class and provide opportunities for students to listen to one another, as well as holding those listeners accountable by having them then track the conversation and give feedback afterwards. Some teacher generated texts, sometimes that lacked some continuity. Maybe you did a listening activity um, and then that was it. And then you went to a reading and they didn't necessarily connect together. But now we have uh, an example of a multimodal activity that we created based on one authentic resource. So students looked at a survey on shopping habits in Spain, which was our target culture for the perfect gift. And they interpreted this infographic and answered questions in the form of a reading. Then students conducted uh, their own survey of uh, their own their classmates and did an interpersonal speaking and listening activity to collect class data. And once they did that, they then answered questions and about our class data, making those cultural comparisons between the target culture and our own, as you can see here. And last but not least, like as the as seen in that perfect gift presentation, we really aim to make topics relevant and of high interest to the students. So students, especially uh, at the middle school level, are often okay with doing the bare minimum. <laughs> so finding ways to consistently encourage them and motivate them is an ongoing process for us. We have done a lot of work 
um, between the middle school and the high school. But as we work on our vertical alignment, sixth through 12th grade, uh, it'll continue to be a collaborative effort to ensure that content and structures in place throughout the sixth through eighth curriculum are consistent and aligned with the high school level outcomes. Uh, how to best serve our heritage speakers. We are always brainstorming on how to adequately challenge heritage speakers and continue developing their language skills within our classroom. Um, some of which taking a deeper dive into target cultures, as you can saw in the flex day extension activities, so on and so forth. In an effort to best serve our special education students, we have worked with the administration to offer co-taught sections to serve our special education population within world language classes, but are still learning on how to best serve and to push them. And on the topic of developing our students' understanding of the interpretive mode, that has been a huge focus for us, as you've seen with our interpretive rubric. We're always looking for ways to improve and develop our understanding as well as our students, um, considering the changes in grading within our building, for example. And we've been working on that through having them look at different levels of responses and assessing them as shown previously. And Obviously a current challenge of ours, like we're still working on our rubrics. The grading commitments have changed within our building and our department every year for the last few years. So we are consistently modifying our rubrics and our grading commitments as we work to make language clear and concise for all to understand and use. So um, let's, let's shift to you. Um... What are some potential obstacles you might might face? Well, um, required resources. I won't lie. I mean, there are some days when we will sit and look for resources and look and look and look, and we maybe just have to stop looking um, because <laughs> uh, we kind of hit a wall or go down rabbit holes. So um, creating resources or finding resources to use in your classroom is something that will be a little bit of a challenge, but I promise you there's stuff out there. There's tons of resources either on the New York State um, Wakelet or through different teachers that you can find online um, that are, are out there to help and to um, collaborate with you. Um, balancing the standard shift and final assessment. Um, so where do you find a balance between, um, you know, whatever tests you're giving and also the standard shift? Um, reluctant colleagues. Um, we, know, we all know that that happens, folks. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it may seem like we're living in, in Disneyland and everything's great, but we've definitely had, um, you know, reluctance here and there for different things that we, we've uh, tried to implement. Planning time, obvious, uh, obvious thing that is the, it never seems like there's enough of. Understanding the world language standards, um, changing our personal mindset, and also um, advocating for our department in this time of such great change, um, making sure we're uh, getting what we need. So let's talk about some action steps that, that we might recommend. First and foremost is making a personal commitment to each other um, that you're that you're in it, right? That you're in it to win it. <laughs> um, you have to really be able to be honest with each other and say that we're not always going to agree, um, but we're willing to work with each other and we're willing to try and know that if we make a mistake, it's not one person's fault. It's, it's, you know, just part of the game. Um, start adjusting your classroom language to reflect proficiency. If I could recommend anything, I'd say start there. Um, it really will make a difference in your, in the work that you do in your classroom and your students. Um, Advocate for planning time over the summer or throughout the school year. Advocate for common PLC time. I know that's a big ask, but you never know until you ask. The worst people could say is no. Um, maybe uh, do the New York State uh, curriculum audit. Um, that's an opportunity. I know that is kind of a next step that I see for us is now that we've done all this unit, all this uh, changing in our units and the shift to the revised standards. Um, you know, what, what still are our gaps? What do we still need to um, adjust? Pick a unit and revamp it and start gathering resources. Um, maybe start small. 
understand it's not going to be perfect. Spend time together with colleagues talking about through the standards, doing unit plans, rubrics, um, and also attending things like conferences and webinars and regional conferences together. Um, those are any time that you can kind of collaborate together in those those spaces will do nothing but benefit you as you look to to make these shifts. So that brings us back to our goals for today. So, so go ahead. Hopefully by the end of this today's session, we provided enough examples and resources for you to be able to say, I can identify actionable steps to develop a unit aligned with the new standards, as Josh just went over those action steps. I can understand how assessments and rubrics support instruction based on the new standards. And I can identify strategies to promote student agency in the classroom environment of proficiency. And just to reiterate what Josh said, I think that proficiency language is a huge component. And that was, I noticed such a large shift in our classroom once we started using those. So we uh, invite you at this time, if you do have questions, they can go in the chat and those will be facilitated by uh, members of the Dream Team. And uh, we wanted to just say thank you for having us and listening to us and spending this past hour with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zoe and Josh. This was wonderful for and um, getting into how you kind of show your work for us on how you've processed all of this, um, uh, these new shifts and then made them happen for your students. It's really was very helpful. It's five o'clock now. And um, we will stick around to do some Q&A, but if any of you need to sign off, um, you fulfilled your um, your obligations um, uh, for for attending the website, the webinar. Um, but we will continue for a few minutes with the Q&A. Um, so if you need to sign off, you may sign off now um, and keep an eye out for your email for the uh, certificate of attendance and when uh, this will be up online. As we see in the the chat box is getting filled with gratitude because um, this was a great, great, useful, practical presentation. It was wonderful. 